Morning, good to see you. Good to see you this morning. Turn your Bible this morning to Matthew chapter 13. And we'll finish up chapter 13 this morning. Matthew chapter 13, we'll get a reading in verse 53. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 53. Good to see you this morning. Praise God for your presence. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 53. Now he's finished with the parables now. We talked about them. We preached on them for several Sunday mornings now. In verse 53, and it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, inasmuch, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? They were amazed by the knowledge. They were amazed by the wisdom. They were amazed by his ability to teach like this. Because as we're going to see, they saw him grow up. Now, he wasn't an, from an affluent family. He was poor, just like they were. He was a <laughs> carpenter's son. Nothing about his youth would make them conclude, have them conclude, he was going to be someone special. Now, we don't know in detail how Christ's life was spent except for the one instant when he was 12 years old but from the time of his birth excluding that one time in the temple all the Bible speaks of and talks about is how that he grew in wisdom and in stature and obviously he I think took up his Joseph's trade and when they saw him they just saw someone just like them and probably hadn't went to the Princeton's and the Yales of their time, highly educated as they would look at and see, but they were just amazed he was so smart, so amazed he was able to expound upon the scriptures and what he was doing, but they just couldn't get past the fact, well, this is just Jesus. We, see, we saw him grow up. He can't be anything special. It says in verse 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Where did this come from? He was God's son. The son of God. But they just couldn't get past his humble upbringing, could they? The fact that they had seen him grow up. They just couldn't get past past that. They just couldn't accept the fact he couldn't possibly be the Messiah. No way he could be the Messiah. And it says, and they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, Two things I want to talk about this morning. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Why do you think it's so difficult to witness to family members? Why do you think it's so difficult to witness to people that have known you your entire life? That's the reason why. Because they know you. And here's the thing. Jesus, who never committed a single sin his entire life, never, not one single sin, and yet they still could not accept the fact that he could be the Messiah and wouldn't even listen to him because they were familiar with him. They knew him. They just couldn't get past the fact, well, he's nothing special. There's nothing, you know, about him that would lead me to believe he could possibly be the Messiah. And so his own, even his family, had a difficult time accepting who he claimed to be. And the people in where he was raised, they just could not, could not accept the fact he was the Son of God. Now then we're talking about Jesus, the sinless, holy Son of God. Now, you and I are filled with faults, are we not? People have watched us 
our entire lives that we know really well. They've seen our shortcomings. They've seen our failures. They've seen us commit sin. And so it's hard for them to accept a message coming from us because they say, who are you to tell me anything? I know who you are. I've seen you. I've seen how you act. I've seen all these things. And so that's why it's so difficult for people that you know very well to get them to listen to you. They would come near listening to somebody they don't know tell them the same thing that you're telling them. But that's just the way that it is. And there's nothing you can do to change that. Because Jesus himself said, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. So look what you're up against and understand that and realize that. And you're going to be met with opposition from people who know you because they're always going to have this to fall back on. Who are you to tell me what do? I know who you are. I've seen you. I've watched you. I grew up with you. I know all there is to know about you. Don't preach to me. Don't you tell me anything. That's people's mentality when it comes to someone that they know. And as I said, you can't change it. You might as well accept it for what it is. And the most important thing is it's hard not to do this. Just don't take it personally. But that's hard to do, though, isn't it? Don't take it personally because that's just the way that it is. If they couldn't accept Jesus, who had no sin, and rejected him because they knew him, how in the world do you think they're going to respond to you, who is a life filled with sin? What do you think they're going to say to you when you say something to them? Don't you tell me what to do. What about you tell me what to do? I know who you are and what you've done. Don't preach to me. That's why it's difficult to witness to people that you know, because that's the response to you in most situations. Just the way that it is. We need to understand and realize you can't change that. You just have to accept the fact that's what it is. But here, you can't let it discourage you from continuing to do what? Tell them about Jesus and witness to them. No matter how they respond to you, you can't control that. You can't control how people respond to you and how they feel about you and what they say about you. You can't control that. The only thing you can control is what? Doing what you know God wants you to do. That's all you can do. And that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. So, understand and realize the task is difficult, isn't it? And we need to understand and realize the kind of reception we're going to get from some people because they know you. They know you. If nothing else, well, I'm just not going to listen to you because I know you. I've seen you. I grew up with you. I know everything about you. You can't tell me anything. That's the way that it works. That's the way that it goes. But don't get discouraged. Don't let it keep you from doing what you know God wants you to do. It's to continue to lift up Jesus and to speak about Jesus and to talk about Jesus. And when the attacks come on you personally, shrug them off. I know it's hard to do. But don't talk about yourself. Talk to them about Jesus. Acknowledge the fact, yeah, you're right. You're right, I am a sinner. You're right, I have done things I shouldn't have done. I, I have said things I shouldn't have said. You're exactly right, I agree with you on that. But here's the thing about it. That has nothing to do with whether or not you're right with God. You've got to Make the decision whether or not to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's between you and the Lord. And if you want to use me or someone you know as an excuse, well, you can do that. And many people do. But at the end of the day, it comes down to this. I'm not compared to you, and you're not compared to me. The measuring stick is far greater than what I am. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you measure up to Jesus? That's what it's all about, isn't it? So, that's what you're up against. That's why it's difficult. That's why it's hard to witness to people that know you because they've got this they're going to use against you. They used it against Jesus, and they're going to use it against you. But did Jesus go and say, I'm done, I'm finished, you won't listen to me, I'm not going to talk to you anymore? No. He continued to do what? Tell them about God's love, about God's salvation. 
here's what this did happen though, what did occur because of this, because of the fact they looked at him this way and viewed him this way. It says in verse 58, and he did not mean in mighty works there because of their what? Unbelief. You couldn't, they couldn't deny his knowledge, his wisdom. They couldn't deny the miracles that he was performing for people and the things he was doing for people. But yet they still could not bring themselves to accept the fact that he was the Messiah. All because of the fact they knew him. And because of their lack of faith in him, not many mighty works were done where he grew up in the place that he come from. It wasn't that he wasn't able to do those things because he was. He's the son of God. But their faith, their lack of faith in him, simply because they knew him, and that's all, we just know him. This is Joseph's son, Carpenter's son. We know his family. There's no way he could be who he claims to be. And because of that, not many mighty works were done. Lack of faith, unbelief. Now I'm going to talk to you this morning about mighty works. This book here is filled with mighty works of God. Things that God has done from creation unto now that we speak of, that we talk about. All these works that God has done to reveal and to show people that He is God Almighty, that He is on the throne, that He is sovereign and in charge and in control, they're undeniable, aren't they? We have, a, as I said, a book that contains all these things. And time would permit that we talk about all of them, but we know they're in there, do we not? They're contained in what he has inspired men to write down for us in this book. All the mighty works that God has done. But you know, the greatest work, the greatest work that God does is the salvation of a soul. Greatest work. Because it took the greatest act of love and of grace to make that possible. And we talked about that last week. Christ's death on the cross that paid sin's debt. Made it possible for those who choose to believe to inherit eternal life. The work that Jesus did at Calvary and rose again on that Sunday morning has made it possible for anyone because when Christ died on the cross he died for every single sin. So everybody's sin has been paid for through his sacrifice on Calvary. But got to what? Believe. You've got to have faith. You've got to trust in that. Accept Christ's person and what he did on your behalf in order to obtain salvation, which is by the grace of God. And so you have many people today, family, friends, neighbors, acquaintances, strangers, who are walking around doomed and damned for a devil's hell because why? They choose not to believe. Choose not to believe. But they can experience the mightiest of God's works, the greatest of God's works by believing and trusting and what Jesus did for them on Calvary's cross. But why don't they? Because of unbelief. People don't go to hell because they're sinners. 
We're all sinners. If you went to hell because you were a sinner, everybody would go to hell. Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. People don't go to hell because they're a sinner. They go to hell because they refuse to believe. Put their faith and trust in Jesus. That's why. That's why there wasn't many mighty works performed here. It wasn't that Jesus wasn't able to. It wasn't because it wasn't powerful enough to. Because they made a willful choice to not believe and accept his person. That's what people do today when they reject Jesus Christ. They make a willful decision not to believe that he is God's son. He's the Lamb of God that taken away the sins of the world. And through his sacrifice, salvation is available to anyone who would believe. They choose to refuse that. And so therefore, God can't perform that mighty work in their life. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. We're saved by grace through faith. So you see, faith, belief in Jesus allows this mighty work that Jesus did on Calvary's cross to benefit you with eternal life. Think about that. People are dying and going to hell. Not because they're adulterers, not because they're murderers, not because they're thieves. They're dying and going to hell because they're unbelievers. That's why they're dying and going to hell. Christ has paid all those sins that they committed on Calvary's cross. They're going to hell because they choose to what? Not believe. If you're here this morning, you're not trusting in Jesus and the mighty work that he did on Calvary's cross for your salvation, my friend. There's no hope for you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, my friend, you're not going to heaven. I don't care who you are, what you have or haven't done, it doesn't matter. If you don't know Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't accepted what he did, you're not going to heaven. I don't care what kind of a Mom and dad, you are. I don't care what of a husband and wife you are. I don't care what you are. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are not going to heaven. Period. Because you're refusing to believe and accept the mighty work that God did on your behalf. The only way to heaven is through what Jesus did at Calvary. That mighty work. The greatest of all works. Greater than parting of the sea. Anything you want to talk about, that's the greatest work of all. But you've got to believe. You've got to have faith in order for that to benefit you, in order for God to perform that work of salvation in your life. The mightiest of all works, I pray God today that everyone here has experienced that knows Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you're here today and you haven't, I pray today will be the day you do that. Don't let your pride keep you from going to heaven. Don't let your stubbornness keep you from going to heaven. Humble yourself. Acknowledge your sin. Quit worrying about what somebody else is doing or what they've done or haven't done. That's irrelevant. I'm talking to you this morning personally. You're a sinner. We've all sinned. You must decide what you're going to do about it. You're going to believe or are you going to reject the message that Jesus saves? That's up to you. That's up to you. But you go to hell because you refuse to believe. Just like these people didn't see these mighty works done because they refused to what? Believe. And I encourage you today, if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, put your faith and trust in him. And he'll perform a work in your life, my friend, that's permanent, that lasts forever. There's not many things you say that about, is there? But you see, God's salvation 
is eternal, permanent, and forever. Now, mighty works. That's the greatest of all. But you know, as we go through life, as God's children, we're not immune from difficulties, adversity, pain, heartache, sorrow, struggles. We have those, don't we? We do. It's part of life. It's a result of sin. Curse of sin. But here's the thing about it. God has already more times than you probably even have remembered did a mighty work in your life. He has. He has. God continually does mighty works in our life if we choose to believe that He can, that He does. God has a plan for you. Let me say this again. God has a plan for you. Not just the person sitting in front of you, behind you, or beside of you. God has a plan for you. There's something God wants you to do. He does. And the only way you can do that is through His strength and through His power. And it will be a mighty work. It will be. God wants you and wants to do a mighty work in your life. He does. Now, let me say this. As selfish, self-centered people, because of our sinful nature, we sometimes think of God doing something for us that only benefits us. God, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. God, I need you to do this for me. We've got to be willing to submit and to ask God to do a mighty work in our life without any stipulations or conditions on what we want God to do in our life. We need to be willing to humbly come before God and have enough faith and trust in God to submit and say, Lord, do a mighty work in my life. And don't tell him what you want him to do. Leave that up to him because he knows what's best, doesn't he? He knows what's most beneficial to you, whatever it may be, based upon the plan he has for your life. Do you even want God to do a mighty work in your life? Sometimes I think people are afraid of the power of God because an example that comes to mind, you remember when Christ went and confronted the individual who was possessed by so many demons, he said his name was Legion. Legion. All he did was run through the graveyard. Superhumanly strong. They couldn't even tie him down with chains and scream and holler. But when he met Jesus and he put his faith in Jesus, they came by and seen him what? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in what? In his right mind. But all those demons that he exercised from this man ran into this herd of swine, and they ran off into the sea, didn't they? And were drowned. What did the people there tell Jesus to do? Won't you leave? Leave. Don't you stand around here, won't you leave? They witnessed such great power, but yet they didn't want to see any more of his mighty works out of fear, and we can only speculate of what their 
all the motivation was for asking him to leave. But they didn't want Jesus doing any mighty works there. We've got to want Jesus to do mighty works in our lives. Desire for him to do something mighty in our lives. That brings honor and glory not to us, but to him. Something in our life that lifts up Jesus. That exalts Jesus. That's the kind of mighty work we should be praying for. And desiring that God do through us. As I said, the Christian life, or anyone's life, is not exempt from adversity and difficulty. We all experience that in life. Paul had a thorn in the flesh that he spoke of, made reference to. And there's been much speculation as to what that thorn in the flesh was. And you can read different commentaries and different opinions. And all these are our opinions because no one can say for certain what his thorn in the flesh was. I believe he was losing his eyesight. That's my personal view. I can't tell that for exactly the gospel truth. I'm just telling you what I believe that his thorn in the flesh was. I think he was going blind. And when you're in that situation, there's some things you can do for yourself. There's many things you have to depend upon some other people to do for you. I mean, you just do. Paul prayed that God would heal him. Remove that form in the flesh. Because Paul was thinking, you know, it's hindering me. I could do greater things for you, God, if you'd remove this form in the flesh. The Bible says he prayed three times about it. Three times. And the answer came, but it wasn't what Paul was praying for. God said, no. My grace is sufficient. Because through this weakness, you'll become more powerful because you become more dependent on me. So you see, God did do a mighty work in his life. Here's what you need to understand and realize. As Paul stated, as the Lord told him, God's grace is sufficient. God can enable you and empower you to do things you would never thought possible. That, my friend, is a mighty work, isn't it? A mighty work. Is there something you're going through, something you're struggling with, whatever it is, I don't know. I don't know your heart. The Lord knows your heart. You know, you, you, you know. Is there something you need God to do on that grand scale, so to speak, that mighty work in your life? Do you want him to do it is the thing about it. Do you believe he can do it is the thing about it. But he can, my friend. He can, but it comes right down to, do you believe that he can? Do you want him to? Do you desire him to? Because God hasn't changed. He's still God. He's still almighty. He's still all powerful. He's still the sovereign Lord of all, my friend. God wants to do something mighty with you and through you. I promise you that he does. He does. But do you want it? That's the thing I'm asking you. Do you want it? These people didn't want it. They didn't want it. That's why they didn't believe. The people who were the Gadarene, the Gadareans, they didn't want it. They asked Jesus to leave when they saw his mighty works. They didn't want it. Do you want it? Do you? Do you believe God can do it? Whatever it is, he can, my friend. You've got to be willing to believe and to yield and to submit and let God do something mighty in you and through you. First and foremost, are you saved? 
Well, God wants to do a mighty work in your life today. He wants to save you. He wants to give you eternal life, my friend, the greatest work of all. But you've got to be willing to believe. God has a plan for you. As his child, yeah, God has a plan for you. He's wanting to do something mighty through you. For him. Do you want it? Do you believe that he can? That's your decision. That's your choice. If you believe God can do these mighty things, well then, <coughs> allow him to. Allow him to do it. Have you ever just done it? God, I'm yours. What would you have me to do? What do you want me to do, Lord? That's what I'll do. God still is a mighty God. He's still doing great things. It comes down to you want them in your life. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you and praising you once again, God, for your mighty work of salvation. For your son's willingness to die on that cross and pay our sin debt and to rise again, Lord, that through that we can obtain and have eternal life. And God, if there's one here today that doesn't know me as your Lord as the Lord and Savior, I pray today will be the day, God, they will turn in faith to him and allow you to do this mighty work in their life. And God, I pray today if there's someone here struggling whatever it may be God having difficult Lord I don't you know everyone's heart God I don't Lord they may they need a mighty work done in their life God help them to believe that you can and they've got to be willing Lord to just submit and yield to your will and to your plan God we praise you now God in Jesus name we pray we stand there and we sing an invitation to him. Page 57. God is in the mighty work business, my friend. Would you like for him today to perform a mighty work in your life? If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, the greatest, mightiest work of all is what Jesus did on Calvary for you if you'll accept and believe. If you're here and you are a child of God, but you're struggling, whatever it may be, God wants to do a mighty work in you and through you for his honor and glory. Would you allow him to today as we say? Amazing talking about this. Jesus' power to take what you give him and to use it to bless others and do a mighty work. We're coming close to the feeding of the 5,000 we'll be talking about in a few weeks. Where everybody followed Jesus out and didn't have enough foresight to bring their lunch with them. No food. Couldn't send them away too far from the travel. They'll fight along the way. They'll get some, you know. One kid brought his lunch. One kid. They found this one kid who had this, well, I, I think it was, what, two fishes and, and five loaves? I think, yeah. Well, what's this going to, how's this, you know, this 5,000 people, this really ain't going to do any good. And Jesus said, have them all sit down. He took that food, blessed it, broke the bread, fed all those people, and had 12 baskets left over. 
and just think. One sack orange, so to speak, in the hands of Jesus fed all these people. Now you may think that you're insignificant and that you can't really do anything. You don't have anything to give, my friend. Let me tell you something. It ain't about you. It's about who you give it to. Whose hands it's in. So don't you let the devil keep you from giving of yourself to the Lord. God can do great and mighty works just like he did in this case through whatever you're willing to yield and to give up and to submit for his honor and his glory. Is there someone here today, someone here today that God is saying, look, I need you. Just give me what you got. Don't, don't let say that you don't have a whole lot. You ain't got that much. You can't do anything. Jesus said, just give me, give me what you got and see. Give me what you got and see what I can do. Is there anyone here today that God is speaking to saying, look, you need to just come and lay it all down and give it to me and see what I can do in your life? Have you ever done that? Have you ever just said, Lord, here's my life. Do what you want to with it. I give it up. I give it to you. See what God can do. So we sing these final two stanzas. <laughs> Southern Drive, okay. I've never heard him sing with him, but I have heard him play with him. He plays any instrument I reckon he, he can find and pick up. But uh, David said they're really good, David Parker, you know. So if you like bluegrass gospel, and I do, and like I say, I like all gospel music, but bluegrass gospel is my favorite. I'll just be honest with you. I, I just like bluegrass gospel. You'll be in for a blessing tonight, I'm convinced. Tell all those, if, 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 if you, people just like bluegrass, Come tonight. I guarantee you'll be blessed by this tonight. It's 6 o'clock, so remember that. Be praying for this group as they come. Uh, anyone have a word now before we dismiss? Anybody? Anyone? Anyone have a word of testimony? God answers to pray for you. Anything you'd like to share at this time before we dismiss? Anyone? Anybody? Once again, good to see you. I was going to say, I was going to thank God for answering our prayer this week. Amen. Amen. Dismissed this time. Uh, Dean dismisses. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we just thank you for another day, another opportunity that we've had to come join together and worship and praise you. Lord, just thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, just ask you be those who make known for our request here today. You know, each and every need, each and every situation, be those soft loved ones. Lord, just that special prayer for the group that's coming tonight that each and every one will get a blessing from our testimony through their songs. Lord, just ask you be with each and every one here that you lead God and direct us. Keep us safe till we return to your appointed times. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.